Hello, everyone. It's Steve with Aptera Owners Club. Uh, just this past weekend, the Fully Charged Show had an Electrify Expo in Vancouver, Canada, and one of our community members recorded um, some footage from there, which I will be sharing with you guys. So thank you to Oopsie for getting this footage for us, and enjoy, everyone. Okay, so um, uh, thank you all for coming this morning. Uh, we're going to start a little bit early. Um, I hope you don't mind. Oh, That'll no. give us more time to hear a little bit uh, more time to hear about what's going on with that Terra. So I'm going to I'm going to see uh, uh, introduce uh, Steve Amro. Um, he is a co CEO, correct? I think that's what it is. Hey, let's sit down. It's going to take a long time. So <laughs> yeah. So Steve, why don't you give us a little bit of uh, background on where you came from and uh, what's going on? How many people here know who Aptera is? Oh, not many of you, eh? Okay, so uh, sounds like uh, you've got some explaining to do, Lucy. <laughs> yeah. Uh, by the way, just first to address uh, the suit. So I, I bought a travel suit a couple weeks ago, and uh, when I was going to Atlanta, I had to wait uh, for a piece of luggage. And I got asked no fewer than 10 times, uh, where's security? Can you tell me where to find my bag? Uh, how do I get to customs? Because I look like a Delta agent. <laughs> which was not the intention at all. Uh, but it does pack nice and uh, doesn't wrinkle. Um, <clears throat> so uh, my name is Steve Fanbro. I was uh, born and raised outside of Atlanta, Georgia, um, town of Riverdale. And I started working on cars, anything with a gas engine, um, as early as I can remember. Um, even before I could drive or rode a bike, I, I worked as a mechanic at a local uh, BW repair shop, which was also a gas station. So I learned everything about the air cooled beetle. Almost everything you need to do is with a 10 millimeter or 25 millimeter socket. Um, and again, rebuilding engines is working more and more cars. And uh, after high school, I decided to join the Army so I could learn some kind of trade, some way to put food on the table. Uh, that took me to uh, Germany and around the world. And I got out of the Army. I said, well, I want to work on stuff, I want to build stuff. So I went to school on the GI Bill and uh, got my, my BSCE, Bachelor of Science in Electrical Engineering. Um, got hired in biotech at Illumina um, in 2001. And uh, that was a lot of fun in San Diego. Got to make robots and make DNA. And it sounds a lot more complicated than it is. You're really just mixing four different uh, chemicals and reagents. But, um, it was around that time that the idea for Aptera started in me, and it was not to, I wanted to build a car, and I didn't want to build something fast, I didn't want to do something I'd already been done, um, and I wanted an electric car, and at the time, you could only convert an electric car, you couldn't buy one, and so when I started meeting with people that were converting them, I saw that you know, they were getting 20, 30 miles range only, and I thought that was absurd, why is that? Of course, you know, I go straight to MATLAB uh, and I go straight to, you know, books and, uh, and everything else. And uh, I discovered a couple of things. First, you know, battery density, energy density sucked at the time. Uh, lead acid was really the only kind of battery that people could use to use conversions. But I also discovered that cars use more than half the energy uh, just to push the air out of the way. And that's just a result of the design process or the styling process. Cars, since really the time of uh, Carly Earl, have been made like furniture. They're designed as styling exercises. <clears throat> and so I thought, if I'm going to make an electric vehicle, it has to be the lowest drag possible, has to be the lightest weight possible. Otherwise, you know, I would be stuck with 20 or 30 miles range like these other converted cars. And so that was really the genesis of, of Aptera. Wow, it's cool. Um, and that was very interesting. Okay, now when can I get one? I guess we might as well just jump right in. Yeah, yeah when, uh, when do you think uh, we're gonna be able to, or <laughs> give us the uh, production plan maybe, is so, the right way to do it? I mean, you know of course, because we've been working with, uh, with your company to develop this vehicle for a couple of years now, and um, everything that the people have seen with the different levels of prototypes, alphas, uh, gamma, uh, the beta, the green car, the, you know, drag race, uh, the Audi R10, and all of those are various forms of prototypes. We're building the first pre-production vehicles, or what we call PI builds right now, actually starting Tuesday. Uh, PI stands for production of 10. 
and that really spans the spectrum of validation prototype, uh, design validation, um, durability testing, and all the other different validation testing that we have to do with airbags or suspension or braking. Those are all production intent cars and systems, uh, production intent geometries, and uh, basically a production intent vehicle. So that's what we're building now for the first time starting this Tuesday. Uh, when the team from Italy, the team of four, arrives to help us with the very first beam or uh, carbon composite body construction. Uh, we've got materials, you know, the, the frame that you've seen, uh, it's machined instead of cast because it's, you know, it's part of the production of tin geometry, not production of methods. But we've got production battery, production BMS, production powertrain, uh, production low voltage zonal architecture. All those production things will be on this first vehicle. It's already had its first milestone of bench function, so we've been able to put it in drive and reverse on the bench with all the systems working on the bench. And now we're waiting for the body to be built so we can take everything from the bench, put in the body, and then we'll drive around PI2, which will be the first production tent vehicle. That should happen by the end of this month. So one of the things that you decided to do that um, Personally, I wouldn't have done, but uh, but um, you decided to uh, take a auto cycle, which is a three wheel vehicle, and it has the same restrictions as a motorcycle, which means there's no airbags needed, there's no seat belts needed, um, you have to wear a helmet if you uh, if you drive it. Um, but you decided to turn it into a real vehicle, so. Um, uh, I, I, I guess you should be commended for that. That'd be wonderful. But uh, what what drove you in that direction? Well, we wanted to be we wanted to be as, as safe as it could possibly be, and and so that means a couple of things. It's got to have seatbelts. You know, probably needs to have airbags. Um, needs to have a roof crush strength that's comparable to the FMVSS of a passenger car. So there's some, some basics that we took from the automotive FMVSS and said, we're going to do that because we think it's above and beyond what's necessary to make a safe motorcycle, uh, certainly not a passenger car, but we felt it was sort of the minimum that we would want to have ourselves if, if our, you know, our children were driving it or riding in it along with us. And that was really the justification. Yes, I think we could have made a much more austere, uh, decontented vehicle but we probably wouldn't have wanted to drive it every day ourselves or let our, our spouse drive it. Mm. Well, um, I probably would have drove it. <laughs> so anyways, uh, you mentioned Italy, um, and Italy is one of my favorite countries right now because um, it has my favorite um, die casting company, uh, which is uh, Costam. They're the guys who do all the molds for Tesla. All those giant cast molds that I uh, talk about or shown off in my videos, um, those are all, those, all those uh, dyes come from a place called Coastin uh, in Italy. And also in Italy is another company called CPC that was recently just sold. So um, they went from independent ownership to now being part of Mitsubishi. So I'd like to touch a little bit on the manufacturing of the, the, the castings for your suspension system. Let's do that one first, and then I, I'll, I'll go crazy. And we'll, we'll start talking about carbon fiber, the new steel. Yeah, sure. Well, um, when we first took our design uh, to Italy, and we can talk about why we even went to Italy in the first place later. We talk about CPC. Um, CPC is sort of the anchor for us, you know, helping us make high volume composites. Uh, the composites that we were making back in California, there's no way they could scale to keep up with the orders that we had. We had to find something different. That's what took us to Italy, and that's how we discovered CPC. CPC is connected with a network of suppliers that they work very comfortably with to provide products, you know, for Ferrari, Lamborghini, Maserati, others, well-known companies, agriculture companies. And, and they're very, uh, have a very tight knit relationship with these companies. And so when they looked at our needs for strength, materials, uh, et cetera, for the chassis, they immediately thought of Coastamp. Coastamp would be the one that could provide us with these castings at a, at a reasonable cost with the quality uh, that they've had experience with so that when they modeled the part and 
crash simulation, multi body analysis, they know exactly how it will work because they've done this many, many times. So, CoStem has basically taken uh, our original concept of the frame and chassis, uh, which carbon body mounts on, and they've made it producible with low pressure casting. So, it's not high pressure casting and the giga casting. We don't need it for a vehicle that doesn't have those kinds of stresses because it's a 2,000 pound vehicle, not a 5,000 pound vehicle. But we get a lot better quality product with sand casting. And so uh, it's amazing to see them because they're, they're nestled right, you know, at the base of Lake Como in Italy. So you, you think, how on, how on earth could a company in Lake Como of all places, you know, a stone's throw from uh, George Clooney's villa, how can they compete on the world stage for cast aluminum parts? But they do. They, they were packing up 1,000, 5,000 things of a thing they were making, I was mentioning to you, that's going, you know, somewhere in Asia. And the company who ordered them did the calculus and says it's actually better and cheaper to make it in Italy than to make it closer in China. So that, you know, tells us something. It's like they're really good at their costs, they're good at what they do. They make a very good product, and they've got a great working relationship with all of our other partners in Italy. Um, but CPC was an anchor for us to connect them. Um, as I mentioned, we were getting reorders faster than we could imagine. We thought we'd get one or two thousand for the year. We launched a company, we got one or two thousand the first week. So we said we need a different way to make this, uh, this vehicle. And uh, that's what led us to CPC. And um, I would say they've got immense experience that they've leveraged with other manufacturers, white labeling other products that probably most people don't realize. And um, they've, they've opened up this ecosystem in Italy to us that we were really unaware of, where, like car cultures in the blood. People grow up wanting to work in the car industry there. And the, the wages are very favorable. The skill is very favorable. The work ethic is fantastic, you know, especially in that part of Italy. Um, so it's, it's been really great for us. Yeah, I, I, sh I can mention a little bit um, about who does use Italians for, for especially for uh, low pressure uh, castings. And that would be Ford Motor Company. When I was still working for Ford in engine division, I, uh, I sourced everything. All my cylinder heads that were really, really complicated, they all went to Italy. It's not something that everybody knows about um, unless you're in the business. And, and that's where things really make a difference. When you find an organization that can build basically anything you need and they do it at a great price, like uh, you're mentioning the uh, the engine, uh, that's a monoblock engine uh, being manufactured at five thousand dollars. Uh, sorry, five thousand products per month. That's a, that's a <clears throat> that's pretty big, and that's a uh, that's a real feather in the uh, in in the cap for uh, uh, for Costam. And so they they actually make the molds and dies. They also shoot rod. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, they they make the mold and dies for. Uh, that of the big car company we're talking yeah, about. Yeah, that would be Tesla. So anyways, uh, at the end of the day, um, I think that uh, I think that getting getting the uh, castings and whatnot from Italy, that was a genius move. And now what we need to do is talk a little bit about the carbon fiber body, because uh, the body on the Amterra, from a sheet metal standpoint, um, I, wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't even uh, quote the job. That would be a no quote for me. But with carbon fiber using SM, SMC stands for sheet molded compound. So what I'd like you to do is um, is maybe talk a little bit about um, uh, CPC and how they're manufacturing the, uh, we'll call it, uh, some people call it black metal, some people call it the new steel, but it's carbon fiber. Not like what you find on an airplane where it's hand laid up in this process, you put it in warm into a uh, into a mold. It comes down, molds it, clips it, trims it, and it comes back up and it's done. It's really quick and uh, very little waste. And what waste you do have is recyclable. But why don't you tell us a little bit about your experience um, uh, with the uh, with the folks over at CPC? Sure. Uh, well, looking at that carbon process, let's start with materials. I think that'll eventually that'll take us to the Middle East, but it starts up with oil. So first and foremost, we're not burning oil. 
we're sequestering that carbon into a park, into a solar electric vehicle. So that's pretty cool in and of itself. But um, the reason why Mitsubishi is involved with CPC and the later acquired them, because of the sheer amount of materials that's necessary to, to make these parts and the logistics and coordination that's required. If, if they were making this somewhere else, other than at the factory in CPC, that material would have to be refrigerated, stored in a cool environment, shipped cold, otherwise it starts curing. So what CPC is able to do with Mitsubishi's ownership now, and they did this actually before they took ownership, is that Mitsubishi built a plant directly across the street. And every day they mix the material from scratch so that it doesn't have to be refrigerated and shipped. It's actually mixed on site and uh, brought over to the building across the street where it goes into the presses. And there's virtually zero variability. Why is that? Well, when you design the, the, the dies, you know exactly from the CAD the volume in between the die, how many cubic millimeters of, of space there is. And so they know precisely to the gram how much material they need to measure out for each part. And they just put those blocks in the part, it goes into the press, squeezes, comes out, goes into a trimming jig, and then goes into inventory. It's really, it's that simple. Um, so you think about comparing it to steel, steel die stamping, you might have, depending upon the part, I don't know, several progressive dies because of the different steps involved. We do everything in one press. We have the largest single carbon fiber SMC part I think ever built in the tub instead of one press. And so instead of having hundreds of tools, we have you know, 10 tools all to build this, this structural, not body white, but body carbon. So to put things into perspective, if we look at the big castings like what uh, Tesla's putting out and a body that's made out of sheet molded compound, uh, made out of carbon fiber, um, to take a body shop that has uh, maybe somewhere around 750,000 square feet of territory that you're gonna need, you could drop that down by 80% because there's so few parts. When you squeeze it down, I got one part that would come out of carbon fiber where um, normally that would be perhaps um, well, certainly hundreds of parts and thousands of spot welds. But even better than that is when you make a part out of carbon fiber, it's perfect. It never warps, it never moves, it's perfect. Because it's a stone, you've just created a piece of stone. Then you move that and talk about sheet metal, and as soon as you start bending sheet metal, it bends, it warps, it twists, then you weld it, and then because of the induced stresses, it wants to relax or it wants to get tighter. And again, you've got imperfections. And then by the time you get the whole body together, anybody who's been through a body shop knows that there are guys with uh, special tools that they make themselves to bend the parts into shape. And they've also got two by fours that give a, a fine tuning, if you like, uh, uh, to, the, uh, to, the, uh, to the shape. So, and I mentioned before, I'm a tool maker, you do it. and um, I know everything, every trick you can do to try and make steel bend the way you want, but it goes where it wants, because there's always a purchasing agent that's found a big, <laughs> got a big savings on, on, a, on a coil of sheet metal that you wouldn't, uh, you wouldn't want at all. So, so it's, it's really a, a great move. Aptera's made a lot of very good moves, to, uh, to go into what I think is going to be the next generation of car production. Well, on, on the part about the car, but just to be clear for the audience, uh, anyone with aerospace experience, you know, maybe thinking like an autoclaved carbon fiber part, certainly those parts will be stronger on a per weight basis, but they require an order of magnitude, greater labor, you know, the handling of fiber, putting in the mold, consumables, that kind of thing. The beauty of the carbon fiber is SMC in the process that CPC and Mitsubishi have developed is that the materials, the materials are perfectly understood from a multi-body multi -body modeling analysis, which means we can do crash testing, we can do, you know, we can ensure that our torsional uh, resonance and longitudinal resonance modes are exactly what they're going to be. 
because the material is perfectly well understood. With sandwich core composites and high performance composites, they may produce a lighter part, but they can't be modeled as accurately. And because of the discontinuities between the foam and the surface skin, uh, mathematically those are very difficult to model in the edge cases. So you can maybe model up to the yield point, but not beyond that. Um, we don't have that problem with this material. We, we understand perfectly, and they, of course, validated this with their other customers and other products, how this material models, which means we can take weight out early in the design stage with confidence that you know, we're producing a product that's going to meet the requirements of user. Well, there's one other thing we haven't talked about, and that is that carbon fiber doesn't rust. You will never get any rust on carbon fiber. It'll be around for a millennium. It, like I said, you can uh, you can recycle it. Um, Boeing's been doing it for quite some time with uh, the 787. Anytime a panel gets uh, destroyed somehow, usually uh, they call it hanger rash. Somebody bangs into it with a truck, you have to pull that off, put another piece on. Those pieces are brought back to Boeing. Boeing then recycles them and uses the uh, the fiber, uh, uh, the twill, and sometimes they'll use it themselves. Most of the time, they sell it to the auto industries because everybody's got a little bit of carbon fiber somewhere in their vehicle. But uh, I believe that with the with your product, with the Aptera product, having the whole car out of carbon fiber is just a yeah, you're the, uh, you're the first step. Yeah. Recycling is a good point. So the, this particular material that Mitsubishi developed um, is recyclable up to five times structurally. So when they're trimming the flash off the part and collecting that up and putting it in the bins, it doesn't get thrown away, it gets recycled again. Um, and it can be put into a structural part up to about five times. Beyond that, it would be a less structural part, but functional part. Yeah. And uh, there's there's tons of applications for those non-structural non-structural parts. One of them being um, for anybody that's into hunting with a crossbow, that uh, spring that you have is um, is basically made out of carbon fiber. The center pod is made out of carbon fiber. If you've got a good bow, uh, so these are these are things that are uh, secondary kind of life cycles or secondary lives, I should say. For, uh, for carbon fiber. So lots of people say it's really expensive. Other people, uh, they want to um, they want to throw them under the bus because, you know, always uh, it uses oil and stuff like that. I've got to tell you something. Pretty much everybody here has got um, a gallon of oil on themselves, uh, all your clothes, all your shoes. I mean, we're not going to get rid of oil. I guarantee you that. But it's, uh, it's very handy to have... Uh, very handy to have uh, uh, a car that's uber light, which will give you more range, uh, uber uh, stylish, and and whatnot. Uh, what was it? There was a there was something that came out a while ago. Um, the the Amtera um, has less drag than a than a uh, a wing mirror or something. Right, the Ford F is the most popular vehicle in America. It's a Ford F one fifty pickup truck. And the, the side mirror on the Ford F-150 has about the same drag profile as the Aptera. So it's, you know, CD multiplied by the area of the of yeah. thing is a product. The products of both those are about the same. Yeah, so that's uh, that's kind of a, a good idea because, it's, like you said, uh, pushing the car takes away basically about 50% of your power. Um, you just shove in a car from here to there. Wait. Arrow and uh, and friction are your are your top uh, top candidates. So let me we were talking a little bit outside, and it sounds like that here has got a lot of secondary um, uh, secondary interests and whatnot. Using the technology that you've developed for up here, you're actually you got some side bets going that sound pretty actually stunningly amazing. When you when you told me about the aircraft uh, or the airplane airport uh, tugs and whatnot, can you delve into that? Yeah. Well, Aptera's mission is very simple. We we believe every journey should be powered by the sun. Uh, so right now, in our vehicle, you plug it in if you want, but you get 40 miles range per day just from plugging the sun. Maybe maybe in a few years it'll be 60 miles. So maybe with improvements beyond that, in another couple of years it'll be 100 miles. But our endpoint. Where all of our engineers are marching to is 
make every journey powered by the sun. And we think that's really important, not just for us, but for the world. So we said, how do we use this technology to really move the needle with other customers? And how do we bring revenue into the company uh, before we start selling vehicles? Because that's also important. You know, investment is not revenue. Investment is equity. Uh, and investors love revenue. So um, we said, how do we, how do we leverage our solar IP portfolio, which is pretty massive, into other segments? And uh, we launched a pilot project with, I'd say, probably one of the world's largest airlines uh, to solarify with Aptera technology, Aptera panels and electronics, some of the ground handling equipment. And why is that important? Airports all across the world are moving to electrification on the ground equipment. And the ground equipment is some of the most polluting things they have at the airport. The challenge is installing enough chargers at the airport, having a place to charge them. You have slow moving, uh, specialized vehicles that can't really drive long, long distances to get to chargers. So what if they can charge themselves? We thought the airport is really a perfect environment for that because there's no trees and uh, everything is in the sun all day long. And so uh, we've got one of our tractors uh, doing its job at uh, Salt Lake Airport for almost two weeks now, and it hasn't needed to be plugged in at all. So that's all I want to say about that one. Uh, but it's, what is public is some of the other companies we've been working with to do the same, like Polydrops, uh, some other trailer companies. You know, with the Polydrop trailer, you can park that, that uh, camper trailer in the sun and run the air conditioning, the induction stove, the lighting, all from our solar on top. And it's not just, you know, not running to Amazon and buying a bunch of square panels and trying to drill them on the top. These are panels that we produce with RIP that let us bend nice curves that are lightweight, thin, rugged, able, able to withstand the rigors of automotive environment. And uh, we're finding that there's broad application for the expertise in doing that beyond our vehicle itself, as we found with the airport equipment, as we found with polydrops, talking, you know, maybe with other school bus companies, etc. So one of the questions that I had written down was, um, you know, how much more funding do you need? But apparently you just closed off your last round of funding here. And uh, I, I, I am not a financier and whatnot. So I just wanted to uh, uh, kind of uh, get a grasp of what's going on. So the, the uh, funding round was 60 million. But you said that that somehow turns into a hundred million. You want to elaborate on that for the ignorant uh, folks like myself? Uh, how you do that? A magical box that it goes yeah. in. Full box. So uh, it basically, uh, it unlocks the rest of the California Energy Commission grant uh, because that's matching money, so you need money to spend for that. Um, and it also locks some equipment financing. Uh, so you know you're not going to get equipment financing on custom tools, things that have no value in the marketplace. Uh, but you can get financing or leasing with tools that are more fungible in the marketplace. So uh, having that $60 million lets us you know, take advantage of those two things and start the low-volume production. So we're, we're technically starting low-volume production now with the PI builds, these are production tent vehicles. But uh, the first uh, 100 or so vehicles are funded you know, by this $60 million convertible note, this debt offering to U.S. capital. Um, but it also unlocks uh, other other monies, uh, potentially with other governments that we're talking with as well. Uh, they like to see you manufacturing, um, and uh, once they do that, then you know, things begin happening. Conversations are different than when you're not manufacturing. So manufacturing one vehicle, two vehicles, ten vehicles is very important for us to do that. But uh, to date, we've done everything that we have, uh, design, tooling, everything for less than 130 million. We raised 130 million, we haven't spent it all. We still have a pile of cash in the bank. So I'd say probably for 100 million, we've gotten to where we are today. So let's put that into perspective. Uh, at Ford, um, I, I, uh, I, I was in charge of a couple of engines. Um, that's about somewhere around 780 to $1 billion. So 780 million to $1 billion. And then when I moved into uh, uh, maybe a bigger job at Ford, uh, $2 billion, about the right number, 
to uh, to bring a car on online. It's it's very expensive. How much for the phone? Um, and uh, you've done it for like basically <laughs> some change. On so let's let's move this into one other thing. And then uh, there's a gentleman here that's standing here. He wants to ask a question. So the first thing here is, what's the sell price going to be for this thing? Uh, somewhere in the 30s to the 50s. Uh, obviously, we've got to account for inflation when we first disclose those uh, those numbers that we have uh, out there and on the website, even I think now. But um, you know, when we open up the orders, uh, we have vehicles at the very low end and the low. I think at the time it was twenty something thousand yeah. and it's higher in the forties. Most people were forty thousand or higher with their configuration of the vehicle options, etc. So when are we going to see the delivery? First ones, uh, it's not going to be all 50. It'll be a handful of those. It could be up to 10, maybe. It could be 20. Um, and that should be by Q2 of next year. Excellent. Well, thanks. But now we have your question. And I really do apologize. I, I just wanted to get through all of the little notes here. But please, what is your question, sir? Thank, thank you very much. Uh, my question would be towards the production method of, uh, method, methods. Um, there are companies that print rockets with 3D printing. Is, have you thought of 3D printing to produce some parts? Yeah. We, uh, we are 3D printing some parts right now. Maybe not as many as we'd like to, and it's just because it's um, we're just laser focused on, on stopping engineering related activities. You know, the pencils down, notebooks closed, please build a vehicle. And that's, that's the mentality that we're in now. Um, but I would say there are parts right now that could make it onto the vehicle in production that are 3D printed. Uh, in terms of 3D printing metal, we've got some on there now that are 3D metal printed. They're not as cost effective as cast. If I were building 100 rockets a year, I might be able to justify that. Um, but you know, our production in, our production intent is 20,000 units a year. So I have to look, you know, compare the 3D printer cost to the uh, price of a tool part. Good question. Okay, so um, it says zero right here, and that usually means get off the stage. So before Imogene comes up with a whip, I'm going to, uh, oh, wait a minute, we have one more question. Uh, okay, now you put me into the red, so there will be a charge. Yeah. Go ahead. I have a quick question about safety. Because the uh, Aptera is three-wheel vehicle, it doesn't have to have the same safety as a four-wheel car. I know you have airbags, but... Are there, um, have you done testing or like what are the ratings on the safety for this vehicle? We, we haven't crash tested the vehicle yet. Uh, we've done it in simulation many times and so we're confident enough with the design to move forward, build the physical vehicles and then do that crash testing with our airbag supplier. We have to do that to calibrate the airbag, the computer that fires airbags has to go through a lot of crash testing to just validate that process. But in terms of the vehicle and handling the three wheels versus four, as three wheels because we want it to be efficient. Uh, but if you're looking numerically to compare its um, margin of stability, you know, how, how stable it is mathematically, it, it's somewhere on the order of like a Volkswagen Golf in terms of how, how planted it is, CG related to the width and everything else. So I would say it's very safe and stable. Uh, and if you look at Aptera Racetrack, YouTube videos, uh, you could uh, see that validated in real life. And then in a crash scenario, it's all going to crumble, like, you know? No, not at all. Uh, the whole new subframe that we've been designing with Postamp is designed, like most new vehicles, to accordion and push that energy below the vehicle. That's, that's what's taken us so long to get all of that right. And then to make sure that we can produce it in high volume. Uh, and then the, the occupants are actually surrounded by a steel safety cage inside the carbon body. So it's really a hybrid of this cast aluminum subframe, carbon body, steel frame, ties in all the closures, hinges, door locks, everything else. So I would say you're gonna be very safe in the term. Awesome, thank you. Okay, well, thank you all very much. And, uh, uh oh, uh, yeah, thank you very much. I think we gotta, we gotta get off the uh -oh. stage here now. Oh, very quick, okay, all right, go on. How long, uh, what kind of delay do you expect before you do any deliveries in Canada? Since you I, are in Canada. I am in Canada. Uh, I can't give you that number. Uh, 
uh, and be on a public record now because I just I don't know yet. And believe me, it's as quick as we can, but I, I can't tell you an exact date. I'm so sorry. So that's a year and a half.